I met Sitaram Goel in the Anus Mirabilis of 1989 at the end of the year, shortly after the Berlin Wall fell. I was living in Varanasi and I had some administrative, administrative matters to settle in Delhi, so I came for a few days. And um, while waiting, I uh, went to the area where most of the publishing houses are, which is in Darya Ganj. <clears throat> and there in one of the bookshops by, um, run by a Mr. Upal, I found a book called History of Hindu Christian Encounters. And uh, I did the subject greatly interested me. And so I bought it and I read it at one stretch. The next day, I went to the same place. I told the bookseller that it was a great book. I really liked it. And he said, well, you know, you can talk to the author if you want. He lives just down the block, or at least his office is just there. So he, uh, he telephoned, he introduced me, and that same afternoon, I could go there. And then, um, it clicked at once. Um, he was a very, very, very interesting source. He was a very friendly man, of course, uh, but um, mainly what surprised me, his uh, take on the so-called communal situation in India was a very different one from what I'd heard at the RSS. The days before, uh, I had first uh, started exploring this uh, communal situation that everybody talked about in connection with India. And so I'd been to Jande Valan to the, uh, the RSS headquarters and bookshop. And so what I found there was not at all the deep uh, mystical uh, movement that I had been led to, uh, to assume there was. Uh, Western literature about the RSS thinks it is some, some strange uh, movement, typically Indian, uh, somewhat seriously different from the Christian and Islamic fundamentalist movements. But in fact, I found nothing special there. I found uh, old school nationalism that we know in Europe as well. Uh, it was a uh, disappointment, let's say. And so when I met Mr. Goal, he, by contrast, had all the answers. Um, now, of course, that may have been a first juvenile impression, who knows. Uh, but anyway, uh, we got along very well. He also took me to uh, Ram Swarup, his friend and mentor. Uh, he lived alone. The Goel, of course, was a successful businessman. He had a, a family. But uh, Ram Sarup lived alone in a ro rooftop room in the house of some Bengali businessman in Maharani Bagh. And um, so he, too, was quite a revelation in a different respect. Not so much history, but uh, the philosophy behind the different religions. Then um, the context was this, uh, this Ayodhya movement that I noticed was, was gaining in importance in India. In fact, my first discovery of the whole communal problem was the beginning uh, of the Salman Rushdie affair, the, about the censorship of the book, the Satanic Verses. You see, that I learned was in fact a gesture by the Rajiv Gandhi government towards the Muslim leader Sayyid Shahabuddin, who had threatened a Muslim march on Ayodhya in response to some Hindu event that was also planned in Ayodhya. And so Rajiv Gandhi feared that this would be certainly a bloodbath, 
So he offered uh, Shahabuddin, okay, you know, what goodies do you want in return for calling off this march? So one thing that uh, Shahabuddin desired was the banning of this book. So you see that that became a, a world famous affair, but Indians know that in fact it is rooted in the Ayodhya affair. So I started studying the Ayodhya affair and um, it's in that context that um, I told uh, Mr. Goal, you see, I'm, I'm going to write about it, uh, do some research. And, you know, he formally encouraged me afterwards. He told me that he thought that, you see, this was just another plan by Westerners of which nothing would come. Well, I uh, did do that research. In fact, it was not much of research, I must say, because it was a pretty simple affair. The uh, secularists had made it sound as if uh, it was uh, it was obvious that there had never been a temple there. It was, it was just a myth and so on. Now, actually, when you do look into the matter, there had been a consensus that the Hindu temple there had been demolished and forcibly replaced with a mosque. There had been a consensus, meaning that not just the Hindus, but also the local Muslims, also, the British in their day agreed on this. What they did not agree on was what consequence to give to it. Some people said, well, yes, you see, this happened, but it's so long ago, it's no longer worth uh, remedying it. Whereas Hindus thought that the temple should be rebuilt there. Now, um, so that was a fairly simple uh, matter. At that time, also, some Hindu scholars were busy collecting the evidence. So, you see, I, I put that in, in good order. Uh, my job there was not to find new evidence, but to arrange it in such a way that it had maximum argumentative force. And so I, uh, I um, wrote this little book, uh, Ramzan Maghumi versus Babri Masjid a case study in um, Hindu-Muslim conflict. So, Sitaram Goel published that book. At the same time, he was ready with another book, a very important book, called Hindu Temples, What Happened to Them? Subtitle is A Preliminary Survey because the 1800, I think, 35 uh, cases of temple destruction that he discusses in there is, of course, not a complete list. There are many more cases, but already it gives an idea of the magnitude of the problem. Also, you have to keep in mind that a number of these temple destructions are not one temple destruction. For example, the Somna temple was rebuilt eight times. Yet, you see, that figures as only one case here. So uh, the number of temples destroyed is different from the number of temple destructions that have taken place. But anyway, so let's say that it's many. Now, the BJP at that time had more or less uh, monopolized the uh, Ayodhya agitation which was not the original situation. In fact, the movement for the liberation of the birthplace of Rama had been started by a Congress politician, Gulzari Lal Nanda. And initially there was even talk of having the first stone laid by uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. So ultimately it was another Congress Minister, Bhuta Singh, who was present. But so at any rate, Congress did not have anything against building this temple. You see, they accepted that it was a logical thing to do since this was a Hindu place of pilgrimage, not a Muslim one. And that if Muslims made any trouble, they could be bought off with some goodies, like, for instance, the ban on the Salma Rusdi book. That... Um, that plan was jeopardized by the stand of the so-called eminent historians who started pleading in very, very shrill 
stones, that there had never been a temple there, that this was a myth, that the Babri Masjid was in fact the Mecca of Indian secularism, the last bulwark of civilization against the rising sea of Hindu twa barbarity. And so most politicians didn't dare to touch the affair anymore. Now in that atmosphere, the leader of the BJP, LK Adwani, thought that it was useful to bring in a Westerner as an argument of authority, as a supposedly objective, distant uh, person who nonetheless supported the temple, or the temple thesis at any rate. So my uh, new book, my first book, which I think, looking back, was not very good, you know, I mean, it was correct. Yes, it argued there was a temple and there had indeed been a temple there. Uh, otherwise, it's, you know, one of those many books that get written. Anyway, he, uh, he wanted to uh, present that at a press conference uh, to, be, to be presided over by Girilal Jain, a famous journalist at the time. And so Goel arranged for uh, Adwani to also present this book. You see, Adwani had been very reluctant to do that. But then, since he was presenting one book published by Goel, namely mine, he was under a reasonable pressure to also present this other one. And so that is a very important book because the Ayodhya affair thereby became simply one case study in a very large problem, namely of Islamic iconoclasm. And so the, the RSS BJP line had always been, oh yeah, you know, let's, let's have our toy, let's have our little symbol in, uh, in Ayodhya that will catch votes, that will whip up Hindu feeling, they will vote for us. And indeed that worked because in the elections of 89 and 91, the BJP progressed heavily, became the principal opposition party. But you see, that's not how Goal saw it. You know, it was not some little vote catcher, some gimmick. Instead, it was a case study in a very large problem that Hindus had better become conscious of. So um, that way, you know, Adwani was tricked into presenting the book. Otherwise, they've never really referred to that book anymore. And in fact, they tried to disown the whole Ayodhya issue after winning the elections of 91, which partly explains why militants uh, then moved to destroy, to demolish the Babri Masjid in 1992 because they saw nobody means business. If we don't do it, it's not going to happen. The BJP doesn't mean business. It has only gathered uh, under the leadership of Adwani on 6 December 92, just to show to the secularists, look, we are able to maintain the status quo. You people are not, you know, we are able to control the Hindu twa uh, fervor, and so the base workers said, no, you see, we, we mean business. We mean to remove this mosque and have a temple structure there. So that's partly, you see, the, the BJP is to blame, but not in the sense that the BJP engineered the demolition, as has later been alleged by the other side. Anyway, that was no longer Goal's affair. You see, he um, didn't care too much about that agitation. Of course, he too wanted the temple to be built, but otherwise he thought that that particular affair in itself was not so important. So he uh, continued his own work. Uh, at uh, that time, he was mainly a publisher. He had started as a... Uh, uh, as the um, uh, as a trader in books, as importer exporter of books, that's why his company was called Biblia Impex, import export. 
But um, in the late 80s, he had mainly become a publisher of this publishing house, Voice of India. As uh, my book became somewhat known, in fact, I have the, the very rare honor that my very first attempt at book writing was at once front page news in dozens of Indian newspapers. Because, you see, there was Advani holding up the book at this press conference. Okay. Uh, soon after, I met uh, Kushwant Singh, a famous uh, secularist writer, on the airplane from Delhi to Frankfurt. We got talking, and um, he confessed that he had thought that I didn't exist. He thought that I was just a pen name uh, used by Sitaram Goel in order to, you know, gain extra uh, authority, you know, to, to bring in a Western face because that would somehow convince more people. And so I didn't really exist. I was just a pen name. Well, uh, there he could see that I did exist. Uh, but of course, it, uh, it says something about our relation, you see. My, my uh, work about uh, Hindu affairs is very much indebted to uh, the influence of Sitaram Goel. Now, his uh, relation with the RSS, it is always said in, in secularist, uh, you know, so-called expert uh, literature that he is more or less the voice of the RSS and so on. Well, you see, this is really a sign of not having studied the matter at all. In fact, most uh, most literature about the Hindu movement is very secondhand, uh, knows very little. Um, and uh, so to say this means not to have seen the very fundamental differences. The RSS is mainly a nationalist movement, which is partly understandable because it, it, it was uh, created in the 1920s which was the heyday of nationalist thinking after World War I. Nationalist fervor was very strong. Uh, for instance, the uh, Jallianwala Bagh massacre uh, was committed by a group of English soldiers who were veterans of the First World War, and so whose standards of acceptability of violence were much cruder than, than for normal people because they had seen such immense killing, they had been exposed to such immense consequences of nationalism that, you see, they didn't, uh, they didn't think anything of killing a hundred more people. Um, so it's in that atmosphere that a veteran of the Bengali revolutionary movement, K.B. Hedgevar, then decided to start something new, something non-political, namely the RSS. But so that was very much inspired by the idea of nationalism, which is of course also understandable in the context of the freedom movement, of which ultimately it was a part. Now, the world changed, like after 1945, nationalism became a lot less respectable. And the RSS have never noticed. And till today, they are talking about nationalism, nationalism. Long ago, they talked about Hindu nationalism, but they have more and more and more dropped that word Hindu and effectively became secular Indian nationalist, trying to construe everything in terms of Indian versus foreign, like the famous example from the Ayodhya agitation was that they said that uh, Ayodhya pitted the Indian hero Rama against the foreign invader Babar. Now that is a complete misconstruction of the problem because many foreign invaders have come and have not destroyed temples. You see, the Greeks didn't destroy temples, the Hunas, the Kushanas, the British didn't destroy temples. Um, you know, that is typical for Islam. And, you know, you have to say that aloud. 
It was instead a struggle against the Hindu hero Rama and the Islamic invader Babar. That is what explains what happened. So against this um, phasing out of the Hindu factor, and talking more and more about the Indian nation, uh, Sitaram Goel once more put Hindu Dharma in the center. Though you could argue, you know, he called his uh, publishing house Voice of India, not Voice of Dharma. Okay, at that time you see the, the word India and the word Hindu more or less overlapped. Now I think less and less so because the RSS, BJP, have been ever more explicit in insisting on the replacement of the word Hindu with the word India. And so India is a purely secular geographical term, not, uh, not much connected anymore with the civilizational um, element of Hinduism. So, the um, RSS, just like the left today, just like the secularists, is guilty of what I would call the racialization of communalism. That is to say, they want to act as if Islam and Christianity are racial entities. They are inborn and they cannot be changed. I am here reminded of a famous phrase by a French feminist, Simone de Beauvoir, who said and who became famous by saying, uh, uh, on n'est pas né femme, on le devient. That is to say, uh, one is not born as a woman, one becomes a woman. Okay. Um, now that's of course very obviously not true. There is a genetic difference. And so, uh, the same is being said by people of her ilk uh, about the religions, you see. Um, or it should be said, rather, it should be said about the religions. One is not born a Muslim, one becomes a Muslim. You see, that is the great difference. In cases of race, you could say one is born black, one is born white, and that remains true all through your life. If you're born black, likelihood is that you'll die black. And so, and there's nothing wrong with that. You see, that's just the way it is. By contrast, a Muslim, you are not born a Muslim. Nobody is born a Muslim. You become a Muslim. And you can also unbecome a Muslim. And historically, all the Indian Muslims are Hindus who at some point have become Muslims. Hindus, or in some cases in, in Pakistan, uh, they've been Parsis or Buddhists or so, but at any rate, non-Muslims who have become Muslims. Now, as a historian, Sitaram Gaul was very well aware of this. And so that is really the, um, the fundamental difference. You see, this proper understanding of what the relation between the different religions in India is. Uh, I could also bring in the Gandhian line that um, uh, all religions are equally deserving of respect in the sense that you have to be polite against people of every religion, that would be okay. But that is always interpreted in India as the equal truth of all religions. All religions are equally valid. Now, that, that, that uh, statement is so silly, you see, uh, so anti-rational, so sentimental. You know, it is like saying one and one is two is equal to one and one is four. No, they are not equal. They are very obviously not equal. So... Sitaram Gold decided to use his brain, whereas the RSS wing has decided not to use his brain. That's essentially the difference. And so to say that they're all one and the same, how superficial can you get? 
Now, of course, in, in practical life, um, most people who want to do something for Hinduism in India do have links with the RSS in some way or other. And most RSS people in the beginning, they join the RSS because to their knowledge, that is the only game in town. And they want to do something for Hindu Dharma. So they think, what better can I do than join the RSS? So I have no doubt at all about the genuine um, Hindu dedication of people who join the RSS. I don't know exactly what happens on the way up, but the leaders of the RSS, by contrast, are hopeless, are just uh, very fanatical in denying the Hindu factor and in playing up the nationalist factor. Uh, so, you see, Goel once in a while criticized the RSS, more in private than in public. But he did write, for example, that in the life of organizations, there usually comes a stage when the original goal for which the organization was founded is lost sight of, and simply the interests of the organization itself become the real purpose of the organization. And he added, the RSS has reached that point. So that is really the, um, the proper placement of uh, Voice of India in the Indian uh, communal landscape. When Sitaram Goel died in 2003, I edited a uh, commemoration volume called India's Only Communalist. Now this refers to something he himself said. Namely, he would introduce himself as, I am a Hindu communalist. Now, that is a unique thing to say, because in India, no one calls himself a communalist. You see, communalist is just a swear word only given by enemies. The word secularism, by contrast, would be abhorred, for example, by Arab Muslims, you see. Secularism is a watered-down version of atheism, and that they absolutely abhor. So no, no Muslim leader in Arabia is going to call himself a secularist. By contrast, you look in India, communal leaders like, like the Sayyid Shahabuddin we already mentioned, or now, you know, Asaduddin Ovaisi, or uh, the Shahi Imam, or whoever, they all call themselves secularists. And nobody says, I am a Muslim communalist. And similarly with Christianity. You see, they may, be, they may have come all the way from America to India to spread the faith. They are, you know, religiously motivated par excellence, yet they call themselves secularists. And the secularists, the Hindu-born secularists, also call all those others secular. So, and then you have the RSS that also endeavors to be accepted as secular. You know, I remember an advertisement in the 90s that said, Hindu India, secular India. So where then secularism uh, gets the meaning of tolerant of, of diversity, you know, pluralist. That's not exactly the meaning of secular. But at a stretch, oh, okay, well, we'll accept it for now. Um, and so they call themselves positive secularists or real secularists. And that terminology is, is, is defensible, but the reality that went behind it was not so glorious, namely that the RSS BJP and ever more, more today than 20 years ago, have as their highest goal in life to be accepted by the secularists. And so everything they do is motivated by this extreme hunger for some pat on the shoulder by the secularists. Some accepted, hey, now finally you have done something secular. But no matter what they do, it doesn't help. Like a famous example, 
in 2002, the Vajpayee BJP government uh, created a chair for Indic studies, not even Hindu studies, of course, in uh, Oxford. And the secularists said, hey, this is saffronization. They're trying to manipulate education and so on. Okay, well, they nominated Sanjay Subramaniam, who is a, a leftist scholar and a very open declared enemy of the BJP. So instead of finally giving a job to one of their own scholars, boycotted no end by the leftist establishment, no, they created one more platform for their enemies who had platforms enough. So that is typical BJP behavior. Under the Modi government, it's just like that. Uh, they could have started a policy of replacing the leftists in the institution with their own people. Now, first of all, they hardly have any people of their own. They have many like gerontocrats that they want to reward by giving them some post and who are then perfectly useless. Uh, but you see, uh, any, any visionary policy of changing the game, of changing the ideological equation is not there at all. All. Um, so that, that's, that's a tendency I call BJP secularism. You see, Hindu nationalism is a thing of the past. There is still nationalism, you know, like the, the surgical strike against the Pakistani terror camps uh, illustrates. There is still nationalism, but Hindu nationalism is a thing of the past. There is now BJP secularism. So, you see, that is a tendency that Goalji always took his distance from. After the um, attacks in Norway by Anders Breivik, uh, supposedly an anti-Muslim terrorist, in which, however, he didn't kill Muslims, he killed young socialists. Um, but, you know, this sort of European equivalent of what secularists would be in India. Uh, so pro-Muslim, non-Muslims. That's, that's whom he killed. Uh, of course, the, the game was on by all the secularists. They, they really saw their chance, you see, after all these thousands killed by Islamic terrorists, they finally found it, you know, that there was also an anti-Muslim terrorism and so they tried to allot guilt to everyone they had in their sights. So uh, Mira Nanda, a very uh, vocal um, secularist, wrote an article trying to link me, but behind me, uh, Voice of India, with uh, this, uh, this terrorist act. And so she, all the time, you see, she without giving one argument at all, <clears throat> she continuously tries to show that Voice of India somehow is responsible for this act. <clears throat> now, it is true that very many Islam critics, including Goel and including myself, but also including, for example, Winston Churchill, who equated Mein Kampf with the Quran. Uh, that's so an, a whole number of Islam critics have been cited in his manifesto by Breivik. However, Breivik says very explicitly that the time for talking is over. He, for example, had been with a political party that was critical of Islam, something equivalent, I wouldn't say with the BJP in India, or with the BJP as secularists imagine it, perhaps with the BJP, as it was in the origins in the 50s, a Hindu party, okay, critical of Islam. He had been with this party and he had left it because he said, you see, democratic politics, this is all over. The only thing that, ha that, that can help now is violence. Now, that is exactly the opposite position of the one taken by Voice of India. Islam critics, and particularly the Voice of India people, have never harmed a Muslim at all. And in fact, I can testify from private conversations that when news came in 
of terrorist acts uh, or riots in the one sense or in the other, Sitarango uh, would be equally shocked. And he really felt for those victims, whether Hindu or Muslim. So what he wanted to do was precisely to go to the ideological heart of the matter, where you see violence is just not, not an issue. You know, he accepted that Hindus and Muslims were the same people. And also genetically, you know, like, like some people, like, like Subramaniam Swami, uh, wants the Muslims to accept that their ancestors were Hindus. Well, yes, of course, the Muslims know that. And, you see, if ever they would forget, they simply have to look out on the street and compare the Muslim faces with the Hindu faces. They are just the same. Except that maybe they are dressed differently, but that, uh, racially they are the same people. And so, very correctly, you see, uh, Sitaram Goel kept that in mind. And so there is nothing intrinsically Islamic about Muslims. There is nothing that can't be washed off, so to speak. You can perhaps better understand my point if you see the contrast with the Islamophiles, with the Islam lovers among non-Muslims. Take, for example, the state leaders in the West. George Bush has praised Islam to the sky, yet he invaded Afghanistan and he invaded Iraq. Barack Obama even got a Nobel Prize for his pro-Islamic speech in Cairo <coughs> But he invaded uh, Libya. He had uh, Saddam Hussein killed, over which Hillary Clinton jubilated. And, you know, he, he bombed that country back to the Stone Age, more or less. You know, it, it had a very successful social security system. The, uh, the wealth of the country, the oil wealth, was pro properly distributed. And so, okay, he was a dictator. He was not a nice man to know. But he was the best in the circumstances. He was certainly better than that what Libya has become ever since. In Iraq, for example, the American intervention made possible the creation of the Islamic State. So, you see, uh, all these uh, Western politicians just blunder into the situation. They don't know what they're doing. Why? Because they have no proper understanding of the problem. And especially no proper understanding of what Islam is. Yet, they have all praised Islam to the sky. Like the American foreign minister under Obama, um, John Kerry, said explicitly that in Syria they had to intervene to uh, impose through Islam. You see, he had this idea that ISIS was not representing true Islam, though, of course, uh, the, the caliph at the time, uh, Ibrahim al-Baghdadi, um, or as he called himself, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, he could have talked circles around him. You see, he was a doctor of uh, Islam. He knew this, this, his material very well. John Kerry didn't. Nevertheless, John Kerry had decided, oh, but that's not real Islam. We are going to fly in kill thousands of Muslims in order to impose real Islam. You see, and so th that is their stand, essentially. They think their idea of real Islam is so important that it is worth killing Muslims over. You see, that's what Islamophiles are. Um, so, if I were a non-Muslim, and uh, in fact I am, and I hear presidents praising Islam, I'd be worried. But if I were a Muslim, I'd be even more worried, because I know that in that case the bombers are coming. So the Voice of India stand has always been diametrically opposed to the stand taken by an Anders Breivik, or now this, this fellow in Christ Church, uh, who finally, finally uh, committed a terror act against Muslims themselves. So, of course, that is very deplorable, but in his case, 
in his particular case, it, um, it came about because he had interiorized the common media story uh, mixing up uh, religious affairs, namely the, the, the conflict with Islam, and racial affairs. You see, he was not so much anti-Muslim, he was a racist in favor of the white race, which he thought was dwindling. Now, if you want to, um, to make the white race more successful demographically, what you should ask for is that they all convert to Islam. This is the absolutely best way to guarantee a higher birth rate. Okay? But no, you see, he had been told that, you know, there is such a thing as anti-Muslim racism, which is a totally nonsensical concept, Islamophobia and so on. So he thought he was making a fist in favor of the white race by attacking Bosnian Muslims, convert New Zealand Muslims, and so on. Many white people, along with Pakistanis and whatever, you know, made up uh, the public in that mosque. So you see, against all that confusion, what we need precisely is the Voice of India message of uh, intellectual clarity about these ideologies and particularly about the doctrine of Islam. I will also make a, a somewhat less sensational uh, contrast with the tendency within the RSS. You see, there they cultivate complete confusion about Islam. And one consequence is that when some conflict happens about, you know, love jihad or, or attacks on Hindu processions during Hindu festivals or whatever, some small local riot, then the RSS does not have an explanation. And so some people are facing the fact that, well, here there is a problem. And so they react in any which way they can, often violently. And so to the extent that there is Hindu violence against Muslims, much of it is explainable by the utter conceptual confusion. You see, if these people had felt, oh, you see, our leaders are taking care of the Islamic problem, are taking care of the communal problem, then they would have trusted those leaders and not taken the law into their own hands. But because those leaders are totally confused or are even carrying out the opposite policy, namely continuing the appeasement policies of Congress and the other parties, which is what the BJP government has mostly been doing, then you see they are, they are hopeless and they feel the only thing they can do is something they do themselves. You know, just like the boys who demolished the uh, Babri Masjid. You see, they felt, they felt left alone by their leadership, so they took it into their own hands. So that is also the, the case with Hindu violence. You see, if the Hindu leadership would follow the guidance of a Sitaram Goel, uh, this communal problem would be handled far more orderly and far more successfully. Because now you keep on having the same problem in Pulwama. You had again the same Islamic terrorism against the Indian state in this case. And so this problem is indefinitely continuing, is in fact getting worse. The Islamic presence in India is, uh, is getting stronger. Um, in fact, uh, there recently was a claim that uh, Musharraf, the ex-president of Pakistan had said that, uh, okay, Pakistan can lose wars against India um, and India can have successes in, in some respects, you know, space, travel and whatever. Uh, they can show that they're with the big boys, unlike Pakistan. Nevertheless, what they can't prevent is India becoming Islamic because our best allies are the Indian Muslims, and they don't have to do anything. They just have to become more and more numerous until they are the majority. And then India will become Maha Pakistan. Now, I don't think that Musharraf said that. You see, I think it is, again, one of these, one of these internet hoaxes. 
Nevertheless, he, even though he may not have said it, he had a point. You see, that is how it goes. Um, so the only chance that India has not to become an Islamic state is to wean the Muslims away from Islam. And that is a very easy thing to do. You give them proper scientific education, not just scientific education about, about uh, computers and, and spacecraft and so on. No, no, scientific education in evaluating their own history, in evaluating their own religions. And so then they will gradually get come to see through the claims that make up Islam. And so that is the only, that is the only thing that, 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 that can solve the problem. You see, more knowledge, more proper knowledge, more uh, irreverent knowledge, more candid knowledge. And that is what Sita Ram Goel has worked on. And so that is a, a, a very sacred task that I want to continue. Thank you.